party make preparations for their second delve into the underworld beneath the castle of the quest. Having lost four on their previous delve, after returning to the last redoubt, they found four replacement adventurers through the guild hall. These replacements I rolled up in the last session. Three fighters and two clerics, as you may recall. One of the fighters is a dwarf. The dwarf hired two heavy foot retainers, and Alara Nightshade still has two loyal light foot retainers. Originally bandits she found in the underworld and enticed into her service. Consumables such as torches and food have been replaced where required. The delve begins at 9.30am on the 7th of September in accordance with 1-1 time and the full character roster for the delve is as follows. First the two original survivors, Ilara Nightshade, the magic user and appointed leader of the party, which call themselves the Questing Knights, and Finnick Overhill the Halfling. They are accompanied by Fresh Blood, Amaris Preach and Birdalone the Faithful, both clerics from the chapel of the Guild Hall, and Viridis the Strong, a human fighter, and finally, Sidric Irondelver, a dwarf. Before we move on to the delve, I want to let you know that I'm going to switch up my approach this time. Having already been through a turn-by-turn -turn account of the previous delve, where I recorded the action as it was unravelling with my dice in hand, this time I'm not going to bog viewers down with a repetition of the same thing. I think I've given a fairly decent account of how the mechanics work in the underworld. So what I'm going to do this time is recount the events of the delve in more of a detailed summary. However, when something important occurs in which I want to impart some useful information regarding the rules or my own rulings, I will stop and focus in on the event and expand on the details as appropriate. As we go along, and the campaign expands, the game will be looked at on the campaign level, and we will see where we end up. So, with this in mind, let's look at what happens during the second delve. Note that this time, I will be checking for wandering monsters every single turn, which is as the rules suggest. Up until now, I've gone easy on the party while I settled into the campaign. Those days are over now. So, turn one. The party make their way through the mazy passages once more. Having descended the stairs, both heavy foot and a single light foot retainer are sent forward to open the first secret door. The sliding section of rough stone is no trouble. The party pass beyond through the short corridor and the same three attempt to force the secret door open. They struggle with this one, and they don't manage to open it until the third try. As they make their way along the long ten foot wide passage, which leads southeast past the trap door that goes down to level two, they hear chanting emanating from beneath their feet. Something strange is occurring on that deeper level. So this is a prime example of what I discussed with you in my last video. At intervals of movement there will be periodic rolls for random noise. If you take a look at my detailed time tracker, each square represents a single 10 second round. These rounds are ticked off as the party move and perform actions in the dungeon at a rate according to their movement speed. 
there are colour coordinated squares which show up at intervals and these are based on the relative movement speeds. Green for light foot movement, yellow for heavy foot movement and red for armoured foot movement. My party are moving as heavy foot in accordance with their encumbrance. They move at 180 feet per turn and so in keeping with the intervals recommended for random noise as per Gary Gygax suggests in the AD&D DMG every two thirds of a turn I will roll for a random noise. Squares marked in yellow indicate when this roll should be made. If I was moving at a faster light foot speed I'd be rolling for noise every half turn or every 60 feet and the green boxes informs me when I should be doing this. So what happened in this first instance was on round number 40 or about six minutes into the delve as the party were moving along the corridor past the trapdoor I reached the yellow square on the time tracker and rolled for random noise. The result was chanting Hence the party heard chanting from below. Moments like these do not necessarily affect the game itself, but they certainly can if common sense suggests it, and I am certain we will run into one of these events at some point. These noises do however create tension and atmosphere, and are also very likely to affect decisions the party make. For example, if a low level party hear a gigantic guttural roar to their east when they stand at an east west intersection then chances are they will want to go west. The solo player will have to make these calls and apply common sense as well as a little discretion. It's difficult to say just where these little moments will take the game but over time we will certainly find out. So let's continue. The party rush along the corridor away from the chanting sounds below and enter the first major chamber where a wide staircase leads down at the north end of the room. The party ignore this and proceed to a secret door in the southwest corner which they previously had to break through with maces and axes. I said in a previous session the secret doors were sliding sections of stone wall. So to rationalise this, and I have updated my dungeon key to accommodate, the secret door here was a bit of a rough crumbling wall of stacked stones, invisible at first glance, but easy enough to bash through. So the door could never be opened, but that does not stop the party from trying. If I was ever to use this dungeon in a group game, these little details created from rationalising the random results create some pretty interesting challenges. Turn 2 The party pass across the threshold into the familiar gas chamber. This chamber contains a trap which releases a strength gas that temporarily increases character's strength. However, they do not trigger the gas and so are unaffected. There are two doors on the north wall and they take the easternmost door which still remains spiked open from their last descent. As they make their way along the passage beyond this door they pass a broken door to their left and as they pass by it they hear a mighty roar beyond it. They immediately take a southwestern side passage in order to flee from the source of the sound. After 30 feet, the passage turns northwest and widens to 20 feet, and then, after an additional 30 feet, the passage turns north into a 10 foot space filled with a strange fungi growing along the walls. So, this is an example of a general feature. The category of dungeon dressing, as per the new rules I introduced in the previous video. The section of dungeon the party has just been through was previously unexplored, so I was using my version of Gary Gygax's solo dungeon adventures random dungeon tables 
When rolling on table one, periodic checks, I introduced percentage chances to roll up dungeon dressing of either a general feature or a noise. A general feature was indicated here, and the result on the dice was fungi. Once rolled up, I added the information to the dungeon key for future reference. These general features help make a more mundane place much more interesting. I have customised other tables on the random dungeon generator. For example, when checking the space beyond a door with table 2, there is a 50% chance of an air current, odour or air feature. The same is true for checking passages leading from a chamber. When checking for the contents of a room, whenever the room is empty, there might be a feature there also, which can include current, odour, air, general or noise, depending on the dice. These built-in dressing features are a great way of bringing a dungeon to life in a solo game, and would also probably work well in preparing for group games too. As the party are examining the fungi-filled passage to the north, which appears to dead-end after 30 feet, they suddenly hear footsteps approaching through this passage, but they cannot see whatever is making them. It's as if they are made by a ghost or something invisible. The party turn to flee back in the direction they came, and no sooner than they begin to move back along the diagonal passage, they hear a loud bang coming from somewhere off to the east, more or less in the direction they are fleeing. Turn 3 The party flee back into the strength gas chamber and take the other door on the north wall. As they pass through the door, which was already spiked open, they hear a grunting sound coming from the darkness behind them, beyond their torchlight. Perhaps they are being followed. They make haste, and beyond the door, a diagonal passage takes them 30 feet southwest, 30 feet northwest, and opens into a 20 foot wide northwest junction. See how these random noises enrich the narrative a little. They're also great for influencing the direction the party will take as well as their speed. A good example might be when trying to escape through a door, when they believe they are being pursued. They are not likely to stop and listen, but in a blind panic, will make decisions as quickly as possible. This relies on the solo player making these calls of course, but just letting common sense and logic guide this should be enough. You might have noticed that two delves into this solo game, and we have only once used an oracle. That's because, for the most part, we don't need one. Procedure is the thing that drives this game forward, and that procedure mostly already exists within the OD&D rulebooks, or can be created with some imagination and logic with perhaps a smattering of AD&D mechanics. The simple rule I follow is to gap fill the spaces between the rules that are already there, so as to maintain the integrity of the original game. Turn number four. The party continue navigating through the maze. From the northwest junction they move west, then southeast, and as they pass through a door, they hear snapping from behind, somewhere in the distance. They keep moving. Through a small chamber, they take the right door, pass through a larger chamber, through a broken door, and into a passage stretching south into darkness. After 30 feet, this passage turns east, and as they reach a northeast-southeast Y-shaped intersection, a loud thud is heard to the northeast, so of course the party take the southeast passage instead. You get the idea in regards to mixing in these ambient sounds. As I said before, I'm not going to present every inch of the game as it progresses, as I've already covered how delving in solo games works in my previous videos, so instead I'll showcase the important parts of each session 
or present examples if I want to illustrate something I think is valuable. This won't make it difficult to follow the campaign, so don't worry about that. If anything, it should make the pacing better and the whole thing an easier pill to swallow. Let me know in the comments though if there is anything specific you would like to know and I'll do my best to get back to you, which may be either in direct response in the comments or in the videos themselves. Be patient though, as it can take me a while and I don't have time to get back to everything, so I have to be a little selective. In fact, it does spring to mind that uh, Vinnie Magus asked a question a while ago about whether I'm generating the dungeon on the fly or beforehand. I'm doing it on the fly, but confusingly, the map included in the videos is a little ahead because I can't draw it up in real time on camera due to technical limitations. Right, the game. As the party continue to explore the maze below the Castle of the Quest, as they are moving along a large 20 foot wide corridor, almost an hour into the delve, the first wandering monster is indicated. Four zombies come shuffling along the corridor ahead of the adventurers. There is no surprise and distance is at 50 feet when the first sounds of shuffling and moaning are heard beyond the torchlight. The zombies manage to win the initiative and clamber towards the characters. Viridis and Sidric, two of the current party's fighters, use pass through fire on the zombies. Pass through fire as per chainmail rules, allows stationary missile troops to fire on any enemy units which are within their missile range at the half move portion of the turn. They take out two zombies doing this. Following this, the Lightfoot bandits working for Alara move into the melee that occurs after the pass through fire, and then the zombies attack and kill Sidric's heavy foot retainer. Three return blows are made against the zombies and a further kill and so ends the first round of the melee. The party wins the initiative on the second round. Now, I allowed Sidric to move into a rare attack position here. In Chainmail, it says that after the first round of melee, Figures unopposed can be moved into flank or rear attack positions if movement at half their normal speed allows them to. One of Ilara's light foots also moves into the melee and achieves a flanking position. I just want to mention here that I'm aiming for as much consistency as possible when it comes to how I implement these old combat rules. But please bear in mind that OD&D is very much a scholastic practice. So there is bound to be times when things get a bit wonky. If I miss something, misapply something, or just downright misunderstand a particular rule, I'll try and correct it later so I'm not misleading anybody. I've been jotting down plenty of notes in the margins of my rule books as I uncover new things. This campaign is a journey. This brings me to another point. When resolving melee using the alternative combat system, this can be a daunting task, as it is not always clear who should strike first. Chainmail dictates that the attacker strikes first in most cases, but it is not always clear who the attacker is when several figures are involved. We literally have that situation in this current combat. Up until now I've just been adjudicating using common sense, but something more robust is definitely required here, and unfortunately 
He's not present within the rules across the three little brown books, chain mail, or the later supplements, as far as I can see. So, what do we do? It looks as though the rules leave this matter in the hands of the referee, which is, of course, not so straightforward as an approach when playing a solo game. There are a few clues to be found within Gygax's various publications that can help. It looks as though, referring to men and magic, dexterity is applicable to getting off ranged attacks first. Doesn't appear to be talking about melee. I did, however, find something helpful in Warriors of Mars, which was published by Gygax and Bloom the same year as OD&D. It provides some rules on conducting melee for individual combats, or one-to-one -one combat. Regarding melees, it says they are conducted differently when fought on an individual basis. Blows are given according to initiative. To determine which figure strikes first, the following priorities are used. One supersedes all others. Five is used only when all others do not apply. Priority one. If one figure surprises the other through ambush, flank attack, rear attack, etc., it strikes first. Priority two. The figure with the longer weapon strikes first. Priority three. The charging figure strikes first if weapons are of equal length or if the defender's weapon is shorter. Priority 4. If man versus animal, the man strikes first. He needs it. If man versus man, the figure with the higher level of ability, 13th, 12th, 11th and so on down, strikes first. Priority 5. The figure which did not just move strikes first. Now I know that this is not od and but the significance of this, I think, is that it shows at an earlier time the way that Gary thought about smaller scale combats, skirmish games, etc., where one figure represents a single person. I think what we could take from this is that a sensible approach for a referee to take when attempting to adjudicate who strikes first could be the use of a priority order. If we use this list of priorities in the alternative combat system, my first instinct would be to throw out weapon length, which is essentially weapon class. As Men and Magic says regarding the combat system that it is based upon the defensive and offensive capabilities of the combatants, such things as speed, ferocity and weaponry of the monster attacking, are subsumed in the matrixes. There are two charts, one for men versus men or monsters and one for monsters versus men. Notice the subtle reference in the text to monsters and not both humans and monsters, it is clear that neither attack matrix is based on weapon versus armor, like the original chainmail man-to-man -man system, but this does not necessarily mean weapon length cannot be considered. I had some back and forward conversation with several members of the OD&D discussion pro board, and it was pointed out that a figure charging with a sword should not get first strike against a defender with a spear, so I have kept the consideration for weapon length. However, it would make sense to throw out the man versus animal advantage, as this seems explicit to warriors of Mars. So in od and priorities might look something like this. Priority 1. If one figure surprises the other, through ambush, flank attack, rear attack, etc. It strikes first. Priority two. The charging figure strikes first if the defender's weapon is shorter or of equal length. Priority three. The figure with the higher level of ability strikes first. 
this higher level of ability should not be the same as character level, but based on hit dice. So in that sense, if a level 2 fighter is fighting a level 2 magic user, then the fighter would have the higher level of ability. And finally, priority 4, the figure which did not just move, strikes first. If I apply this to the present situation with the zombies, then this is how it plays out. Sidric and one of the Lightfoot bandits have surprised the last zombie through a rear and flank attack, so they strike the first blow against it. They score a single hit, but no kill. The zombie cannot return a blow on Sidric or the bandit because it was taken by surprise with these rear and flank attacks. Nobody has charged this round, and the zombie, heavyfoot and bandit are all equal in ability. So this is a curious scenario now. I think it makes sense to go with initiative when all else fails. So the characters who won the initiative in this combat round get two attacks against the zombie and somehow they both miss. The zombie can return a blow, a die can be rolled to determine which figure it will attack, but this won't be necessary on this occasion as the zombie missed. On the third combat turn, the zombie wins the initiative and will continue to attack. It uses its initiative in the movement phase to turn towards its rear attacker. It automatically receives second blow position against this attacker. The characters can now make all their attacks, they get four in total, and two of them are at plus two due to the rear attack bonus. One attack hits and scores enough damage to kill the zombie. Post melee morale is then conducted for the heavy foot retainer due to losing his comrade. The result of the roll on three six sided dice gives the heavy foot retainer a minus one to his morale dice. And so ends the encounter. This encounter, as it played out, does marry up with the example given in Strategic Review Issue 2. Because in that combat, the Orcs surprise a 4th level fighter, use their advantage to cut to melee. They are the obvious attackers, so strike first. They grapple the hero, and his return blow is used to essentially shrug them off. On the second round of melee, the Orcs no longer have surprise, and they are not charging. So in this case, according to our list of priorities, the figure with the higher level of ability strikes first, which is of course the fourth level fighter. And this is exactly what happens in Gary's example. 